Welcome back to the Wingspan Podcast, episode 44. I'm Doug Barak, joined by my co-host Chris Mulholland of Nets Daily and our special guest. He's the radio voice of the Clippers. We welcome Noah Eagle to the podcast. Thank you for taking some time every day to join Doug and I. What's going on, man? Not much, guys. Everything everything is good. I feel a little bit left out because both of you have very on-point facial hair, and I shaved mine yesterday. So now I thought this was going to be about my actual wingspan. Instead, it was about my lack of beard. So I'll have to get over that as we go on. Well, we're going to be reaching out a lot of things throughout this podcast, so we'll get to see your wingspan uh, through and through. It's monstrous, just so you guys know. Look forward to it. So can you talk about your journey to where you are today? What college did you go to and what was your first relevant position or internship? Sure, sure. So journey in terms of life. I was born on December 11th, 1996 for all those keeping tabs on my measurables. I'm five foot seven and three quarters, but I round up to five foot eight. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a happy go lucky guy who likes to go through life. No. Uh, from a broadcasting perspective, I would just say that it started early. I was always a fan of public speaking, and that had been passed down from generation to generation. My grandparents were entertainers, as you guys, I'm sure, know a little bit about. My grandfather was an actor and comedian. My grandmother was a singer. And so I, that passed down to my dad, who, at a very young age, focused on broadcasting and focused on sports broadcasting. And I think for most of his life growing up, grew up in Queens. He grew up not far from from Shea Stadium. He thought, well, one day I'm going to be the voice of the Mets. And I love the Mets. And I mean, he was born the year that they won their first World Series. He was a freshman in college the, the year they won their second World Series with the ground ball through Buckner's legs. So everything was culminating to, I can't wait for one day to be the voice of the Mets. And everything broke and it ended up being the voice of the Nets. So it worked out in the right ways for him and, and everything, I guess, matriculated the way he saw it, just not entirely with the very clear specifics. And thank God, because he loves basketball. That love of basketball was passed down to me. And from a very young age, I just became engrossed in the sport, especially with the Nets. But I was a huge, huge Nets fan growing up. I had the Vince Carter photo on my wall. I had Dr. J dunking at the free throw line with his New York Nets jersey on my wall. I mean, I had Nets things everywhere around my house, and rightfully so. There's a franchise that has given us a whole lot and has provided my dad with a purpose for a long time, let's say. But with that and seeing him go through it, I think that I just saw the joy that he woke up every morning excited to go to work, excited to prepare. And so I would sit with him in his office when I was three, four years old, and I would just turn through these media guides, which for those who don't know, because they very seldom exist in a physical form now, those were booklets at the time. They're all online now, but they're books with basically all the information on the team heading into this season. And so I would look through them all, and I would try to memorize as many players and facts and everything that I could to the point that when I was younger – real young, I would wake up every morning and I wouldn't tell my parents which player I wanted to be known as that day. I would want to just be a different player every day. And so one day they would say, Noah, good morning. And I wouldn't respond. And they'd have to guess who I was going as that day until they said, Dirk, The, the original, you? who am I? Yeah, exactly. That's right. Maybe Frank DeGray stole that from me. I'm going to have to ask for royalties. But I would, you know, any, any random day, Dirk. Vince, Jason, Le- well, no, LeBron wasn't even in the league yet, but LeBron, you get the idea. We'd be in the supermarket, and they'd be calling my name. And Noah I wouldn't respond. Noah would not respond. Finally, Shaquille, yeah. And, uh, the people passing by are like, really? That's a odd name choice. But I loved it so much that that's what I wanted to do when I was young. And so I think... As time developed and I realized my physical traits weren't going to lend itself to me being a standout on the court, the best way for me to stay with the sport was to do exactly what I had seen given my dad joy all these years. And so uh, by the time I was 13 or 14, I decided on broadcasting. I decided on Syracuse eventually from there. And it was a great choice. It really helped me get to where I am today. Yeah, definitely. That makes plenty of sense. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about your pops and the family a little bit more. But um, Chris, go ahead and ask away. 
Yeah, so no, I'm very big on mentors. So obviously I'm in the sports media field myself and I know how impactful mentors are. So I we, we could have a clear idea who your number one mentor is. But who have been <laughs> some of your mentors throughout your short career? And what's the what's the best advice you you would say that you received? Mentors, or as Joey Tribbiani called them, mentos. Yeah, those are great. You need those, whether it be the candy or the people. And although I can't really smell your guys' breath from miles away, so I can't, I can't confirm that you need some mentos right now in your life. But you certainly need mentors if you want to get to where you hope to be. And my dad is always going to be number one and head and shoulders above everybody else. He's always been there for me, and the hope is he always will be, and I have a feeling he will be always be in my corner. And so anytime, it's not even just, hey, how can I get better on the air? How can I improve in this area of the craft? It's also, how do I handle myself in this situation versus this situation? And I think that's even more underrated than people give it credit for, how important that is, whatever your field is, whatever you decide to go into. If I decided my marine biology instead he would have been there as well, and he would have. I'm sure I would have been able to ask him. Well, what do you think? How can I handle this situation? He still would have had an answer. He's an incredibly bright person, and same with my mom. So both of them I would still consider as my top mentors. But the people I went to Syracuse with, and and the professors I had there, and people that I could go to and ask, hey, what do you think needs improvement? What do you think I should be doing to further my career? X, Y, Z, invaluable, absolutely invaluable. So I, I would absolutely credit a lot of it to a lot of them because they were there from day one on campus all the way until the day I graduated and still today. If I need anything, if I have any questions, I can always email, text, call them, and they will drop anything and, and be there to help. So that's always great to know that you've got people like that that are always willing to be there for you. And then other QS alums have been there over the years Mike Tarico has been a great friend of my dad for a long time, and so he's always there. And if he catches one of my broadcasts, he always shoots me a text. And there are a lot of those, the Adam Shines of the world, the Andrew Catalans and Carter Blackburns. And you go through the list, Adam Zucker, so many Syracuse alums that are successful and they want to help. They want to pass their knowledge down. They want to pay it forward. And so my whole philosophy is I'm going to want to do the same. As for the best advice that I've received, I would say the biggest thing to remember, and I just look at this in life, everything you do and how you act is contagious. And so when you're in an environment, be conscious of of how you're presenting yourself because it is going to spill over to everybody else. And so if if you're positive, smiling, fun to be around, that's better. People are going to want to be around you. It's going to attract more. If you're negative, that's just going to spread around the negativity. So I'm always a very positive, optimistic person. And I would say the other thing, and most important thing, is no matter what you do, never lose sight of who you are. Always be yourself. And this is very true in broadcasting. I think you guys know my dad is very much himself on the air. You get his full personality on the air. But that's hard when you're first starting to figure out the balance between being professional and showing your sense of humor and showing off what you enjoy and veering away at times from the game, it's hard to navigate it when you're first starting. And so over time, just keeping that in the back of your mind is crucial to your development as a broadcaster. I think it's crucial to your development as a person. So whatever you decide to do, if you're a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, whatever, as long as you're being yourself and doing it, you're going to fulfill whatever you need to fulfill. You'll feel like you're doing what you're supposed to do. And I think you'll be much happier. So that would be, the long answer between those two things, the mentor, mento, and advice. Well, that's very well said. And then I got one, I got one more for you on, on that topic. So for people that are looking to get started in the field of broadcasting, which is your field, and they're looking for kind of, kind of that start, you know, everyone's always had that, that rough patch. Where do I start? How do I kick it off? How would you kind of sum it up and what would be your best advice in that realm of things? I would say a lot of hair gel. It just seems like all broadcasters use a lot of hair gel. No, I I think the biggest thing for broadcasting is if you're just starting, you need to get reps and you need to try it first, see if you enjoy it, because that's very important. There's there's too much work and too much time that goes into it that if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to do it well. You're not going to excel at it. 
So enjoy it first and make sure that every time you do an event, it's enjoyable to you because that reigns through to the listener, to the viewer. But getting reps is the biggest thing for anybody who's just starting. The more you do it, the better you become. And so that's really, it's a very simple equation. I know it sounds like it's a simple equation, but it's true. The more you do it, it's no different than anything else. If I want to be a great shooter of the basketball, I'm going to shoot as much as possible. I'm going to take 1,000 shots a day from the outside, whatever it might be. Take, make 500 free throws in a day. If I want to be a great shooter, it's all about rep. If I want to play piano, I have to keep playing it to get better. It's no different. You're exercising a muscle in your brain. So the biggest thing to say at first, do it, do it, do it, and then listen back, listen back, listen back as much as you can with a very judging ear, judging eye. How can I improve? Watch and listen to other broadcasters that you respect, that you think are very good. Say, how can I take some of what they do and blend it with my style? It's a process over time. And I think the biggest thing to keep in mind for anybody, and I always remind myself this, anybody who's a broadcaster should remind themselves this. You're never a finished product. I, I, product yes, product, not project. Never finish product because here's the thing. I don't care if you're doing it right now for the first time or if you're Bob Costas and you've been doing it for 40 years. You're never a finished product. You can always get better, whether it be a very minute change, minute shift. You can always improve some way, shape, or form. So always keep in the back of your mind. You're never finished. Just keep getting better and you're doing the right thing. Yeah, it sounds like a vocal marathon. <laughs> That's right. So uh, what does it mean – to be an eagle, and uh, how has your influence? Uh, how has your family influenced you on your journey? It sucks. It's the worst. <laughs> the The eagle family is great, and it's not just for my dad, but my mom, my sister, my grandparents, etc. It started with my grandfather and grandmother, as I mentioned, in the entertainment industry, and so my dad went to them when he was seven, I believe and told them he wanted to be a sportscaster. He had a terrible lisp at the time. And so the initial response right away, didn't even bat an eye, was from my grandparents. They said, okay, that's what you're going to do. It wasn't a, oh, well, that's a tough field to get into, or you might want to temper those expectations. It was, that's what you're going to do. Dad said, and five goes, you might want to get rid of the lisp. And my dad said, what lisp? You know, he's like, you want me to record? So you had to record him. He goes, oh, no. So my dad, and this is this really shows how much of a ridiculous person he is. No sort of speech therapy, nothing. He just took a couple days in the mirror by himself, and he fixed his own lisp at seven years old. So that's at least how he tells the story. Urban legend, let's say, has it as such. I don't know if I believe it, but if that was true, I feel like they'd write movies about that. That's ridiculous. Either way. So that's with that in mind, the idea of having that support in your corner is imperative. And so he had it in his corner with his parents. So when I was younger, I didn't bring this up before, but my first job in my head when everybody was saying when I was super young, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? It wasn't astronaut or cowboy or anything like that. It was TV dentist, which isn't real. That's that's a fake thing that I made up of combining Dr. Oz and dentistry and then realizing over time that people don't want to look at other people's mouths being filled for a cavity. No one wants to watch that at noon on a Wednesday. But I thought for some reason when I was five, that was a great idea. And the difference was, as I said, my dad went to his parents. They said, that's what you're going to do. I went to my parents when I was five or six and said, I want to be a TV dentist. And they said, what the hell is that? I'd say, eh, it's a dentist on TV. They said, that's not real. And, and that's, but good luck. Good luck with that. But no, they've been incredibly supportive. And I think the whole point I'm making in this is having my parents there every step of the way and feeling that support and knowing that they believed in whatever I was going to do, whether it was TV dentist, whether it was marine biologist, whether it was accountant, didn't matter. They were going to back me 100%. That's so important. And this is true for everybody out there who has kids. Whatever they want to do, if you back them 100% and make them feel like it's possible, they're going to work that much harder to get there because they believe it's possible. When you have people telling you that you can do it, generally you feel like you can do it. And I think you accomplish it. 
My dad said it was invaluable for him to know that growing up. If they had told him, oh, you know, we'll see. I don't know. We might not have Iron Eagle on the Nets games. We might not have no Eagle doing Clippers games. You know, it, it's a ripple effect. And so being part of that family has is, is been amazing. And being able to follow in his footsteps and try to fill those shoes, even just a fraction, has been a ton of fun and incredible experience that I wouldn't trade for anything. And yeah, it's been it's been awesome. I, I don't think I have my love for entertainment and all that stuff if I wasn't an eagle. Let's put it that way. Well, Ian, if you're listening, uh, your son is sending you so much love. But anyways, <laughs> uh, what was it like seeing? You mentioned this a little bit, but seeing your dad on TV growing up. Yeah, we actually that these glasses don't actually provide any sort of seeing help. It's actually telepathy from me to Ian. So he felt all the love. I gave him from across the country. As for seeing him on TV, it's funny. This I get this question all the time, and I did growing up as well. Because in New Jersey, when the Nets were in Jersey for the majority of my youth life, people saw him and people knew him and still do, obviously. But at the time, it was, man, that's cool. Your, your dad's a part of the – you see him on TV all the time. What's that like? I said it's no different than any, anybody else going and seeing their father do his work or their mother do her work, if I'll use the dentist example again, because for some reason I'm obsessed Oral with Oral hygiene. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I like teeth. I don't know. I, it's not even like I like teeth. I don't really know where this stems from. I, I need to okay. really do it. Yeah, I need to do a deep dive into my past. I need to do one of those real deep dives into the back of my brain, because clearly there's something that happened when I was six months old. Something, something I, with the tooth fairy. Yeah, a dentist must have saved my life. I'm not even sure what happened or I had this dream that I'm not sure. I, maybe I need to – there's a different purpose for me in life where I need to create some sort of dental movie for people to see and appreciate the life of dentists. I'm not sure, but I'm going to use the dentist example again anyway because for some reason it's there. If your dad's a dentist or your mom's a dentist and you just went and, and sat at work with them – most people would say, man, what's that like? You know, it's no different than that. I think if you just, it's just, to me, it was just normal. It was expected. It was from the day I was on the earth, literally. He was doing the Nets when I was just an idea in his head. And so from the day that I joined earth forward, he was always on TV. He did a game the day I was born. He, I was born. He got to the game later that night and the Nets actually won. And in the midst of an awful season, I know this. They beat the Seattle Supersonics that day, and I believe it may have even gone to overtime. I know it was raining. I've gotten all the stories, but they thought I was good luck because the Nets won that day. And just from that day on, I just it was normal. You know, it was expected. He would pop up, and that was that. It really wasn't a whole ordeal. So I wish I had a better answer for you, but that's pretty much it. It's fine. It's the question that's always on repeat. But something you may not get asked a lot is how do you compare your – father's broadcasting style to your own it's similar it's very similar i mean it's bound to be similar i'm I, we share dna so <laughs> with that alone i think that just naturally things are going to pop out it's hard not to want to style your own style like his because his is so great and it's so enjoyable and entertaining that fans love it and so i try to take only bits and pieces i don't I don't try to jack too many of his calls. I try to stay away from that. You know, I think a lot of people just assume that I would use Rack Attack or Man's Jam all the time. I don't. I try not to because that's just the, they're not me. Now, he's given me, he said, you can take whatever you want. He, he said, you can do whatever you want. And, I, and as time goes on, we share things with each other. And if we see something that might work, we give it to the other one. I think that's that's bound to happen as I've entered this business and he's happy to happy to give me anything, let's say. But like I said, I try to I try to pave my own way while still taking from him, if that makes sense. So the entertainment references, it's all going to be there. The jokes, the sense of humor. I try to do it all, basically, just in my own way, in my own style. And I think it's working so far. And we'll see as that develops, because as I mentioned, I'm nowhere near a finished product and I, I never will be. So that's still developing and we'll see where the voice takes me from here. Well, it's funny you brought that up. Uh, can you give us your best Iron Eagle impersonation? <laughs> I mean, I can. I would say his new favorite call. Well, there, there are a couple of new favorite calls over the last couple of years. 
One of them that he really uses a lot now with the Nets is, got a three. He likes that one a lot now. That that came out of nowhere. That was never a thing. And I actually remember it was it was my senior year at Q's because it was the, the year that D'Angelo led them to the playoffs. And so that was when he first started using it. I just we were talking on the phone. He goes, by the way, I really like this got a three call. I think it could work. You know, just saying got a three. I'm like, oh, OK, good. I'm glad you like it. And sure enough, it is stuck and it, it works. He's, he's really made it something good. He's also his other newer favorite call, which he's used in the bigger moments now the last five, ten years, is he's not human. So, which is, we got a lot of Karis LeVert is not human. We got a lot of D'Angelo Russell is not human. And now we're getting a lot of Kyrie Irving is not human. So, yeah, they're getting there. I mean, like I said, it's not quite there, but I sound semi-similar. You can't, very can't deny that. Can't deny that. But um, but when you now this is an interesting question. When you look at uh, just your whole perspective of your young career, right? What are some of your greatest accomplishments that you're like, wow, I did that? Like you, you know, you have that feeling, or some of those accomplishments you're like, you know, I really pride myself in those. I think everything I've done. I don't think there's anything that I humble. look at. <laughs> yeah, seriously, very much. I'm very humble. Uh, actually, you know what? Let me go get my trophies from from my youth. Go, show go ahead. Youth. Well, no, I I think that. It's really more so that I don't have anything where I look at it and say, man, that's unbelievable. I, I look at everything that I get to do as unbelievable. I'm just I'm thankful to be able to do all of it. And so the fact that I get to call the games for the Clippers or that I got to do the junior NBA global championship stuff with Vince Carter, which was a dream come true to be able to work with the guy that you idolized. Or the fact that I got to do summer league stuff or the Nickelodeon game or Tennis Channel or Sirius XM. It's all amazing, in my opinion. So I don't know if there's one thing yet that I would single out. I'm sure as as more happens in my career, I'll have probably a more specific answer. There have been people that I've gotten to encounter, like Vince, who have been kind of those moments of pinch me and, whoa, did that really just happen? Another one at the Junior NBA Global Championship was I got to interview Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And as someone who grew up such a fan of the NBA, just to be sitting next to the guy who made so many historic moments on and off the court, civil rights and everything that he did, that was surreal. That was just a surreal type of moment. And I got to interview a bunch of other great people at that event as well. It's less about the events that I'm doing because all of them are amazing, but it's more about the people that I get to encounter that gives me that, whoa, this is really cool moment. Yeah, no, definitely. I can relate to meeting Kareem, although it was very short lived. It was All Star Weekend in New York, and he was at the Adidas store. And I know him from the movie Airplane, so I made <laughs> sure that he autographed that Roger Murdoch. So that was that was my big highlight with meeting Kareem. That's I, probably one listen, of my favorite I'm with movies. you, by the way. I'm with you. I could. I, I think I might be able to quote that movie front to back. I've seen it so many times, and so part so of you me can't was be serious. Uh, <laughs> I'm serious, but don't call me Shirley. I, this is my thing with Kareem was I sat next to him and I'm trying my hardest not to bring up airplane because I'm sure he gets that all the time. The last thing I want to do was be unprofessional and be like, I loved you in airplane, by the way. I mean, that movie was 40 plus years ago. I'm sure he's heard that thousands of times. So I just kept my cool breathe, meditate, whatever you needed to do in the moment and said, uh, Mr. Abdul Jabbar, all the way up to the stars. Yeah, fair, fair. So we talked about it a little bit, but kind of want to deep dive before we talk into the NBA. So can you talk about your experience calling the NFL game on Nickelodeon? Absolutely. What was it like for you? How did you land the role? And do you expect was, more partnerships like that in the future, whether it's Nickelodeon or another network? I do think that that Nickelodeon wants to do more of them, and certainly with the NFL. I think it was it was such a it wasn't surprising that it was a success. I think it was surprising how much of a success it was. It was so well received, not just by kids, but adults as well. The nostalgia factor for people of of seeing the, these Nickelodeon, hearing these Nickelodeon shows of their youth was, it, it struck some nerve and some chord in people that they enjoyed it and, and they felt something. And so that was really cool to me. Some of the cooler messages that we got was the the people that were telling us my daughter's never watched a football game and she sat through the entire thing or Kurt Warner's son who 
who has had issues through his life and has never been able to watch a game, watch the whole thing. And so he texted Nate Burleson, his son's 31, I think, or 32, and he texted Nate after the game to tell him, and, and Nate relayed the message to us. And it was just, those were the, the moments that were like, wow, this was really, really cool. Because it wasn't just what we did, but it was what it meant to some people. And so to be a part of that, the first ever Nickelodeon broadcast of an NFL playoff game was surreal. It was one of those surreal moments without a doubt. And as for getting it, as for being a part of it, CBS Sports reached out to me. They thought I was a, a good choice for it based on my age, based on my my likes of sports and entertainment. And I like to blend and blur those lines. That's what I set out to do, even when I call Clippers games. And so it was. I, I felt like this assignment was really tailor-made for me because I could appeal to different age groups and I could do it while bringing back all my Nickelodeon knowledge. I felt like all that, all those hours growing You're up. You were all that. I was all that, yeah. I had the guts. I was ready to go. Double dare me to do anything. I was in. So I, I felt all those hours of watching Nickelodeon growing up, they were, they were put in for good reason at this point. I was ready. I was just preparing for this moment. And so when I got the interview with Nickelodeon to see if they would like me, one of the questions was, well, did you watch the channel growing up. It's not a requirement. Before she even finished, I go, yeah, yeah, watch the channel. Watch it all the time. And I just list, I rattled off every show that I watched. It was a list of at least 10. And I think from there, they trusted that I'd be good for it. And we just went ahead. And, and basically what we decided, it was myself, for those who aren't familiar, it was a playoff game between the Bears and the Saints, NFL playoff game, wild card weekend on Nickelodeon. And so... It was a normal broadcast, but with slime, with animation, and we agreed. And by we, I mean myself, Nate Burleson, NFL longtime wide receiver veteran who is now on TV, Gabby Nevaeh Green, who is on one of the shows on Nickelodeon, the reboot of all that, and Lex Lumpkin, which doesn't sound like a real name. I assure you it is. It sounds like almost a JV superhero, like you couldn't get Lex Luthor, but you did get Lex Lumpkin. That's what I thought initially when I heard about him. And then I met him, and he's great. I enjoy to be around. Talk about positive energy. That dude just oozes positivity. And so we had him. He is 14, 15 now. Gabby's 15. So that was to bridge the gap almost between us. I was 24. I am 24, I should say. And Nate, I don't know. He's in his 30s. So into his 40s maybe at this point. He's somewhere around there. I mean, he looks like he's 25. The dude is a legend. So anyway, we had all of us, and we just agreed before the broadcast, let's just have fun and see what happens. There's no expectation. The other thing that was great, the best thing, was that it hadn't been done before. So we had a blank canvas to paint ourselves, and that gave us a freedom to really just be ourselves the whole time. And so it went really well, and people seemed to respond to it. The game wasn't great. But that actually somewhat helped us, I think, because we could do our hijinks and whatever. I did not get slimed. I've gotten many hate mail for not getting slimed. People are very upset that I didn't get slimed. It's going to happen eventually because I do think this was not the, the last of this. It sounds like there's more in the works, and we'll see if it stretches across other leagues. But right now, the NFL is definitely interested in bringing it back. So hopefully next season we get to do it again. Yeah, and hopefully for every touchdown, the broadcasters get slimed. <laughs> if uh, the, the only problem I have with getting slimed, I, I really wanted to because anybody who grew up watching the channel, I, I played it off like I didn't want to on the air, but I did because anybody who grew up watching Nickelodeon, it's a dream to get slimed. Are you kidding me? You see all these kids doing it, you're like, one day that's going to be me. I don't know why I used some weird older voice, like, one day it's going to be me. No, I, I thought that was a dream come true, full circle. In my life, and it just didn't happen for a variety of reasons. Sean Payton took my bucket, one. But two, the equipment, the people who were in charge of the equipment, I should say, the CBS and Nickelodeon said, do not do that. Because I guess if it gotten into any of the, the stuff, the headsets or the monitors, it could have really done some damage. So they didn't want any of that affected. But for me, my own personal reason that I would have been somewhat, only slightly opposed, is because Gabby told us, the first time she got slimed, it took her two hours to get the slime out of her hair. And as you guys heard early, you need a lot of hair gel. I use good product in my hair. This doesn't happen by accident. This would have been a problem for me. I would have not been thrilled 
having to go back to the hotel and try to somehow wash it out of my hair before getting up for a 5 a.m. flight the next morning. None of that would have been good. So that was the only reason I was thankful it didn't happen. And now I need to know when they're going to slime me because I'll have a hat on ready to go. Well, at least it's not Gorilla Glue. That's right. It could be, though. I'm not even sure what the texture is. I did feel it, and it was it was exactly the texture you'd expect, but I don't know what it's comprised of. I heard that maybe in the past it was some sort of yogurt or cottage cheese. I don't want any of that in my hair. No, that doesn't sound, that doesn't sound like it goes good with hair, especially when you got some gel in there. No way. No one has ever ordered cottage cheese or yogurt with a side of hair. Just to <laughs> just put that out there and make that clear, that's not a general good combination. Yeah, those two don't go together. But let's let's go from slime to scary hours. So let's let's dive into some nets. So you're a North Jersey guy like myself, so you know the rough times of the nets in New Jersey, right? So what's your first? You talked about it a little earlier, but what's like your first memory of be of kind of just being a Nets fan? Go back, way back. So I was born in 1996, and at that time, you know, mid 90s, it's a bit of a shift in how the team was being operated. You're away from the D.C. Kenny Anderson days and Drazen Petrovic, and you're moving closer towards Jason Kidd, but you're in that limbo in between. And so my early, earlier moments and earlier memories are with Stefan Marbury on the team as their star, all-star. And I, I remember at some points being on the court as maybe a three-year-old, and Stefan is stretching on the floor and I'm just right there, and I, I this was my first moment of a, oh, my God, look who's in front of me moment, Stefan Marbury. So those are my first memories. The teams were not very good, but, but Stefan was. He was great. He was a killer for them. As mentioned, he made an all-star team. Then they make the trade for Jason Kidd. And so to me, I would say the first substantial memories are the two finals appearances. I went to every one of those playoffs games. Literally, I was at every single one. I remember the ground shaking against Indiana, game five, first round against the Pacers with Reggie Miller making that half-court shot, which was, I believe, late. It was, there was, if you remember, there was the TNT clock and then, or was it ABC, whoever it was, whoever was calling, doing that game, their clock versus the clock in arena, they were different. And so one of them had the shot being late, and I think it was late in person, but they called it good, Reggie Miller. If you go back and watch the video, Reggie Miller, to send it to overtime. I believe the shot should have been, it should not have counted. But it did. They went to OT. Reggie then had a dunk to send it to double OT. And then Ron Mercer took over in double OT. And the Nets won to advance to the next round. And that was a big one for them. They needed it. They needed to prove that season wasn't a fluke. That they were for real with Jay Kidd and Kenyon Martin and RJ. And so being at those games and being at those seasons just was absolutely incredible and then i remember as as things started to turn after kmart left for denver that first season <laughs> i mean this is just i'm taking you through the journey of a nets fan in the early 2000s basically kenny martin leaves after the the couple of finals appearances losing to the lakers and the spurs and by the way they should have gone to seven in that series with the spurs and i will say this too jason kidd got robbed of mvp that year by tim duncan absolutely robbed and I will go to my grave saying such. He deserved MVP by far in what was, I think, 0203. Deserved it 100%. Anyway, I digress because I'm now going in a bunch of different directions. After that, I remember Kmart leaves and Zoran Planinich was like this new hope for the team. You're like, this guy, you know, he's got a chance to be good. Nana Kristich as well. You got Kristich and Planinich. You're like, you know, these guys, they got a chance, you know, a couple of years, give them a few years. But at the same time, you're still trying to compete. With Jay Kidd and RJ, and so that year did not start well. I remember going to one of the first games, and it was Shaq's first year with Miami Heat. And they lost. They got crushed by Miami. Plotinich was not good. Jay Kidd could do only so much. D-Wade, young D-Wade, and that Miami team would win the title the next year. But for that year, the Nets just couldn't stack up initially. And so they make that trade for Vince Carter. And that's where my fandom had already blossomed but really exploded. To see that trio of VC. J Kid and RJ, it was just fun every night. You knew it was going to be a show every single night. Jason Kidd's passing ability, RJ was really coming into his own as a player and, and really starting to shoot the ball a little bit better from the mid-range. And then VC was still VC at his height. He really was. You know, I think all the highlights you see are from Toronto, but he had so much in New Jersey, and he was he was scoring at a ridiculous clip. 
he was doing things that people were. I think if Twitter, if there was Twitter back then, I think people would know just how great he was with the Nets because he was a show every single night. He had some of those 360 layups before anybody was doing that. He was just doing things that that people didn't expect. So that's where my fan boomed. Then those three, they eventually get rid of it. Brooke Lopez era into the Devin Harris years, into the Darren Williams years in Brooklyn. And so I've been with it every step of the way. And I still, there's obviously still a piece of me that is there. But yeah, no, the Nets are really what helped grow my my sports fandom. Forget NBA fandom, my sports fandom overall. Because I love the team and I was going to ride or die with them every step of the way. And as being a knowledgeable guy as yourself, you know, you just laid out the whole history of the early 2000s and Nets. <laughs> I got to ask you, do the Nets retire Vince Carter's number 15? Ah, I'm not sure. I think there's a decent chance they could. Uh, Toronto will. Toronto yeah. will. And they should right away, honestly. They should do it now, although they can't. I guess they're not even playing in Canada this year. So it makes sense that they wouldn't do it in Tampa Bay. Although it is, it would kind of make sense for them to do it in Tampa Bay, considering Vince is from the area. So that's a, that's a whole different conversation. But I think they 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 could, and they maybe should. Uh, they should probably retire Vince. Uh, they might retire RJ at some point. Obviously, they already have retired Jay Kidd. So I could see it happening, but we'll see. I think if they had made deeper runs in the playoffs, it would have been a certainty. They just they they ran into some really tough teams. They really did. They ran into that Miami team with Shaq and with D Wade, and Detroit was still really good. And then eventually Boston in two thousand eight. And so by the time that that run was over with those three guys, it was just they just ran out of time, quite frankly, because of the teams they were facing, and they just never fully got over the hump. But I, I could see them retiring Vince Carter's jersey, and you know I would love that. I would love it too. And then on top of that. From the 2000 to the Brooklyn move, how would you kind of just sum up that whole New Jersey legacy right there? I think they left their mark. They really did. I think they they yeah. left their mark as a team that wasn't expected to do anything. I look at the Clippers and the Nets, and I talked about this a little bit with Michael Grady on the pregame last time these two teams played. Very similar trajectories in terms of their organizations. And so that's why it was an easy transition for me to go from the Nets to the Clippers now because it's very similar in how they have gone through this journey, the ups and downs. The, the Nets have had more, far more ups, I should say, in their history than the Clippers. But of late, the Clippers have really been a consistently great organization and have proven that they're going to be contenders most years, really since 2010, in the last decade plus now. 2011, really, would be Blake Griffin and Chris Paul and company coming together. But the point being... I look at the the way that these organizations came up. They started in for the Clippers, Buffalo, for the Nets, Long Island. Then they move for the Nets, move to New Jersey. The Clippers moved to San Diego and eventually L- L.A. and Brooklyn. And I look at it as the, they're teams that are, quote unquote, little brothers within their markets, but have made their mark and are really trying to prove that the little, little brother can still fight, too. And I like that. I always liked being that part of it. I, I, I always, I think fans, some fans at least, aren't thrilled with people saying the little brother syndrome or XYZ. I think it's better. I think it's better to be in the shadows. Everybody wants to talk about the bigger team, quote unquote. I'd rather be the one that's winning the games. And right now, you can say that certainly about the Nets. They're winning a lot of games. They've got the headliners. So, so what? If the media or whoever else wants to talk about Another team, that's on them. I'd rather have the championship. And I think that both teams are building towards that. So as for their Nets, New Jersey legacy, they, they did leave their mark. The two finals appearances showing what they could do and building up a, a franchise within a state that I don't think people expected that franchise to be built up. And I, I thought it was a fun ride, but it's been even better in Brooklyn so far. They've done an unbelievable job at Barclays Center They've done an unbe- unbelievable job of marketing that team and, and obviously building the unit, building it with star power now. In the beginning of the Brooklyn era, they had star power. And now at this moment of the Brooklyn era, they've got more star power than anybody in the NBA. And that's special. That's very special. Now, before I ask this question, apologies if I bring up any pain. What were your thoughts or what was the thought process when the Nets finalized and moved to Brooklyn? Like they were like, we're going to Brooklyn. 
Yeah, again, I think it's a little, it's understood just based on the logistics and based on the potential fan base that you can cultivate. I think that was the idea in mind. I didn't believe they were going to lose many of their fans in New Jersey, and they didn't. They transferred over. As you know, Chris, they, they transferred over from New Jersey right over to Brooklyn. But then you look at someone like Doug, and Doug, I don't think you were necessarily a Nets fan in their New No, I, I started watching basketball um, when they moved to Brooklyn. My dad was watching the J-Kid era in my room while I was playing video games, and I knew J-Kid's name, but I didn't watch at all. Right. So, yeah, I'm a product of the Nets moving. And, and that's my thought. point. And, and Doug's as big a fan of, as anybody I know of the Brooklyn Nets. If you look on social media, you'll, you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone. Your dad says it best. Super yeah. fan. <laughs> Super fan Doug Barak. I, I think that we can put that on a plaque for sure. I just think that it, what it did, it, it widened their pool. It widened their net of potential reaching, not just fan base, but nationally as well. And that's good. It's a good thing. While it's it's not painful, but you know it's a little sad not to have them in New Jersey with all those years. I was at the last game in New Jersey against the Philadelphia 76ers, sat next to Daryl Dawkins. He was wearing a fuchsia suit at the time, and uh, just to be there and, and remember all of the times that I did have for good or for bad, the 12-70 and 70 season with Terrence Williams and E. Jan Lian. Yeah, I was at a very large portion of those games because they were mostly empty. You know, what he wanted to see what was the worst team in the NBA, but I did. I loved them, and I if even if we had a chance to win one game, I was going to be there. And so all those memories are still there. But I think what they've done with this Brooklyn era has been great from a marketing perspective, gaining a new fan base. And obviously, the, the product on the court has been outstanding, especially in the last couple of years. Sean Marks, <laughs> there are not enough superlatives to describe the job that Sean Marks has done with this organization. And now Joe Sy coming in, he has already made a difference and has already done fantastic work on and off the court. And so when you look at how it's actually worked out for the franchise, you can't really say it's been anything but positive. And that, at the end of the day, is really what matters. Most definitely. And then my la the last question I have, at least uh, based on Nets, what was your reaction to when James Harden got dealt to Brooklyn? And then what do you think about just the whole scary hours in general? <laughs> I didn't understand why people didn't think it was going to work. Mm -hmm. I That was my whole thing. Now, I... I as a as someone who followed that team growing up, as someone who followed the Nets into what they were coming into this year and seeing the development of Jared Allen and Karis LeVert, of course you don't want to lose those guys because they were such a backbone of what you did, of the culture you set. But at the same time, if you have a chance to go out, and it was the same thing with Katie and Kyrie. How many people did you see when that first came together? How many people did you say, well, Kyrie is going to ruin that? Or KD, Kyrie, well, there's only one ball. How's that going to work? When you have a chance to go get two of the best players in the NBA, and now three of the best players in the NBA, you do it. If someone said to you three years ago, hey, you have a chance to have Kevin Durant, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving on the same team, you wouldn't have thought twice at jumping at the opportunity. So when they had the chance to go out and get James, I was thinking – why did anybody think they weren't going to be an absolute juggernaut, especially on the offensive end? Now, I did have my questions defensively, and I think anybody had their questions defensively. But I believe they'd figure it out, and I knew that once the buyout market came, they were going to get another big, and that was a big key as well. And not to mention the health of, of Nick Claxton helps a lot. Nick, Nick Claxton's a really good player, and you give him some more time to develop, get into game shape as well, I think he could be dangerous. So as for the scary hours and all that, I just think they're they're the team to beat definitely in the East and potentially in the NBA right now. They're just so talented that it's hard to picture them losing four out of seven times, definitely in the Eastern Conference. And my hope is that it would be against the Clippers in the finals, but either L.A. team, Phoenix is playing really well. Utah is obviously off the charts good this year. Denver is still really good. The, the West is tremendous. The West is unbelievably good. But Brooklyn's been nearly unbeatable against plus 500 teams. They've been nearly unbeatable against the best teams in the league this year. I just think that anybody who's not giving them their due respect isn't paying attention. And anybody who still has questions about defense isn't paying attention because they're starting to figure it out just enough. 
They don't have to be the best defense in the NBA. They just have to be good enough so that they can use that offense to power them through games. I think they will. I think that they're the team to beat right now in the league. And then I guess to follow up on that, it, do you, would you give them the edge over the Clippers? <laughs> I will tell you this. Here, here's what people don't know about the Clippers. I'll give you a little uh, inside stuff. Mm-hmm. Teron Lue has only implemented 25% of his offensive playbook. He's not giving up any of his cards on the defensive end. He takes over the defense once the playoffs come. So what you're seeing right now is the Clippers in regular season mode. What you're seeing right now is the Clippers also not fully healthy. I think if they are fully healthy in the second half of the season, I think they're as good as anybody in the NBA. And that's when I think that matchup with the Nets becomes real interesting. Because first matchup against the Nets, it was close all the way. Both matchups were close all the way. But the first one in particular in Brooklyn, no Patrick Beverly for the Clippers. And the Nets had all three of their guys. And that one was a four-point loss. And then no Durant in the second one. Clippers have Beverly. It's a four-point loss. I just think that given a little bit more of that offensive playbook in, and let's say if the Clippers do add a little bit more to their roster as well, things could change a bit. So for a seven-game series, I would hope that it would go seven games. But as of right now, based on what we've seen so far, I think the Nets are the best team in the NBA. Well, speaking of Clippers, can you talk about your experience thus far? Uh, What is it like working for such a passionate governor like Steve Ballmer who wanted someone very hardcore to call games on the radio? He did, yes. For those who don't know, that was exactly what what Steve Ballmer told me when I went to interview with him in Seattle. I asked, he asked if I had any questions. I said, well, yeah, what are you looking for in a broadcaster? I probably should know this if I were to get the job. And without hesitation, he said, someone who's hardcore. That's that's my best Steve impression. Steve, if you're listening, I'm sorry. (laughs) Working for him is amazing. He's an amazing, amazing guy. Everything you see of him losing his mind and ripping his shirts and kicking his legs. That's what he is. That's just how he is in life. And I think the coolest thing with him is there are a couple things. What I gathered from my interview, which he sat down with me one-on-one for 90 minutes in his office in Seattle. And we just, we just talked. It wasn't even, it was very informal in how we discussed. It was a discussion more than anything. And he asked me questions that he just genuinely wanted to know about like what were you learning in school of where the broadcasting field is going what do you believe the impact of social media how do you think cryptocurrency could impact basketball moving forward um i did not think any of these questions were going to be coming my way these aren't to get to know me he generally wanted to know because he was going to use what i said and how he made decisions moving forward and that's true with everybody that works at the at the clippers and now at the forum as well which he purchased he listens he knows everybody when I'm walking in Staples Center, he says, hey, no, not just to me, but a security guard. Hey, Tom, whoever the name is. He knows everybody. He sees everybody. He, he goes out of their way to make them feel seen, to make them feel special. He doesn't have to do that, but that's just who he is. He's a truly special type of person, him and his wife, Connie, and they've been great to the community, great in general, just how they carry themselves. They put together things because at this point, they don't necessarily need to work. This is their main baby. He has his foundation. He's got his company, the Bomber Group, and he does a lot of philanthropic work. And that's it for them. They want to, they want to help. They want to pay it forward. They do it in so many ways. So to work for someone like that, it just makes my job and my life easier because you want to do your best work for him. You want to make sure that you're making him proud and proving him right. And that's my goal every day. And, and he also... You never know. He listens to my broadcast or he watches the broadcast when he's not at the game. I had a preseason game my first year, last year. Keep in mind, I hadn't done games, basically. I didn't Syracuse games months prior. I hadn't done games in months. I'm still just fresh out of college, 22 years old. I'm just trying to figure out my voice. And we had our first two preseason games against the Rockets in Hawaii. Which, when they told me we were going to Hawaii, I said, I quit. I'm out. Are you kidding me? What, how would you do that to me? I was pumped. Uh, I, so I got there, and we're doing that first game against Houston, against James Harden and Russell Westbrook. Russ did play. James did. And he had, I think, 40-something. And our second game was against the Shanghai Sharks, which was a real introduction to the NBA for me because I had to learn a lot of names that I did not know very quickly and how to pronounce them correctly. 
Not to mention, my bosses sat directly next to me and listened to the whole game on the headset of me calling the Shanghai Sharks. So, again, that's my introduction. And then our third or fourth game was back at Staples Center against a team from the Australian League. And Mello Trimble, Maryland standout, was on the team and was crushing us in the first half. We're down in the second quarter of this game last year. We're losing to a team from Australia. Now, Kawhi and PG, I don't believe we're playing. But still, that's embarrassing. And yet, I'm calling Mello Trimble making these unbelievably tough shots as him making unbelievably tough shots. I'm, you know, raising my voice. I'm getting into it. And midway through the second quarter, one of my bosses comes up and just says, hey, Steve's listening. He said, don't go too excited for the Australian team. It's a preseason game. You don't want to get too excited for them. I go, no problem. And they go, other than that, he says it's great. I'm like, okay. So you never know when he's going to be tuning in. And so that's really cool that he would even take the time just to listen to the broadcast from time to time. And he does still uh, when he needs to be out and about in the middle of the game. But for the most part, he does show up to our games in person now, especially this year. He's like the only guy in the arena which is fun because I get to see him and how he reacts every single time after every single basket. And it just adds more energy to me. So that's helpful. And working for the organization as a whole, it's a first-class organization. Again, the parallels between the two, we've got Lawrence Frank as our, our president of basketball operations. And so knowing Lawrence a little bit from when he was the coach of the Nets, when I was younger, I had a picture with the two of us from when I was maybe nine or 10. And so I'll bring it up from time to time and be like, "El, you had a little more hair here. He's like, ah, you know, it's back and forth. So to have him is great. To have the group that they do, they just have really good people, really smart people. And to be a part of it is special. Yeah, no, definitely. And it sounds like with the Nets and even with the Clippers, you arrived at the right time. Like that good luck charm. You know, you arrived, the Nets win that night. You arrived to the Clippers, you know, the year that they get PG and Kawhi. So, I mean, what are the chances, right? (laughs) I guess so. I guess I got to go play the lottery now or I got to go to Vegas next. But it's funny, I, I had already known I was going to be doing the job. I already known I got the radio job with the Clippers before the Kawhi and PG News. And so we didn't know what was happening, but I was, I was actually getting ready for Summer League as free agency started. And so I remember I was out on our deck with my mom and dad when the Kyrie and KD news came out. And we had known a couple days that it was a possibility, but we didn't know for sure it was happening. And we were just hearing like, ah, we'll see, we'll see. We thought it was likely, but we didn't know. We weren't positive. And so when it officially came out, I was like, man, that's unbelievable. And I'm thinking this whole time, well, they were looking to go after KD, the Clippers. They wanted, they wanted to get Kevin Durant and pair him with Kawhi Leonard. But I had a feeling that obviously we knew Kyrie and KD were going to be a package deal. And we thought that was going to be in Brooklyn. And the big reason that we thought it was going to be in Brooklyn was because of how big Kyrie he was a Nets fan growing up. How big of a Nets fan he was growing up. And I know my dad's told the train story a little bit about Kyrie sitting with him and talking well, about the, the Nets. Mistakes the it's wrong a great, guy first. Yeah, yeah it's, a great, it's a great story. It's a tremendous story. Uh, but it ended up being a long conversation. RJ was on the train, too. He was still with the Cavs. And so from when my dad told me that after it happened, I had a feeling that one day Kyrie was going to want to come to the Nets, whether it be at the end of his career maybe but there was something in him that he still loved the Nets. And so when everybody was saying, oh, Knicks this, Knicks that, Knicks that, I'm thinking like, but he's too big a Nets fan to go to the Knicks. I think he just, he loved the New Jersey Nets. And sure enough, that was right. So anyway, long-winded part to get to here. I was still so focused. I was, I was laser focused on, okay, they're going to get Kawhi now. They're, they got to get Kawhi now. And he had narrowed his teams down to three, Toronto, Lakers, Clippers. And I didn't think he'd go to the Lakers after they got Anthony Davis. I just didn't think they were going to make it work. I thought it was between, and it it turns out it was, between the Clippers and the Raptors. And I wasn't sure. After they won the title, I really wasn't sure. I was watching that run, and I'm thinking, oh, no. Oh, no. The whole time that Toronto keeps winning, because I'm in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, man, we need to get Kawhi and the Clippers. And he's going and he's winning a title with this other team. How in the world is he going to leave? Sure enough, he does. But I was in Vegas. Actually, I guess I was getting ready for Vegas. I was refreshing my Twitter every second. Then there was that kid, Ari Abraham, that was releasing, oh, Kawhi has told the Clippers no. I go, ah, who is this kid? So we get to Vegas. I'm at Summer League. And it was after the first night of games. 
Zion had just played and ripped the ball away from Kevin Knox and dunked, and then there was a huge earthquake, and we had to leave. They called the game off the rest of the game. So we left, and I go back to the hotel, and I was getting ready. I actually had Clippers-Lakers the next day. And so I was getting ready with their summer league teams, doing my, my prep work, and I 11.05 Pacific time, my phone buzzes, and it's the Woj report that the Clippers are getting Kawhi Leonard. And then two minutes later, because now I've got butterflies in my stomach. Now my heart's pounding. Two minutes later, they get the report that they're getting Paul George as well. And now I'm thinking, holy bleep, what's going on? I, I'm Nobody knows, by the way, that my job next year is going to be with the Clippers. No one knows. It's not public information. I know. And so in my head, I'm thinking, so I texted our TV guy, Brian Seaman, and I said, dude, what? What just happened? He was in Iowa back home visiting his parents with his kids and his wife. And so he was asleep. So he didn't text me until the next morning saying, we have the best jobs in the world, which he's right. It's <laughs> we just lucked out, man. We really did. And so the next day I go to do that Laker Clipper game and our director of communications, Chris Wallace, saw me and he kind of tapped me on the shoulder and he said, I guess we made your job a little bit easier, huh? I said, a little bit's an understatement. And sure enough, we started the season. It was fun last year, disappointing finish. But it's just it's awesome to be a part of a contender because it's it means people are less inclined to hate me because the team's winning. So I'm telling them generally good news aside from our last five games or so. Yeah, no, definitely. And what is it like calling games for a fun guy and playoff P? <laughs> yeah, we use a variety of nicknames for those guys. I, I prefer the claws, still number one for Kawhi. Oops. Board man and fun guy. I, I try to get all of them in. As you guys know, my dad's a, a bit of a nickname guy himself. Hey, iron. Go, go, Good old iron. Joey e. Buckets. You got some Joey e. Buckets, which I've been told I can't use when the Nets play the Clippers, which is fine. I'm not going to use it. The Alchemist, I feel like, is fair game. I've read that book three times. And so I, I gave my dad anything he needs to know about that book. I know it forward through the rest of the way. I got it all. So I was pumped to hear them using the book as a, a nickname reference and that Kyrie and, and Claxton both like the book. But as for uh, Kawhi and Paul, PG-13 is still the nickname we're going to go with. I don't think we really use playoff P all that often until the playoffs. Now, we used it in the playoffs when he played well last year, but not if he didn't. Anyway, what I'll say with those guys is it's fun because you never know what's going to happen. For example, it's no different than, than Kyrie and, and KD and James. Because you just don't know what's going to happen on any given night. You don't know what type of historic performance could be put together. Paul George is one of the smoothest players I've ever seen. Him and Kyrie are the two smoothest players on a basketball court that I've ever seen. Just the way he moves. It's all silky. It's just, it's beautiful to watch. And so to see him, he's put ridiculous three-point shooting performances. Our, our host on the radio likes to call him a 6'9 Steph Curry. Which, if you really look at the stats from the last several years, it's somewhat true the dude is an unbelievable three-point shooter he can do it off the bounce on the catch and shoot shooting like 45 percent from three this year on eight or nine attempts it's absurd the efficiency that he's got going on this season so that's that's awesome to be a part of that and he's also super super athletic so you never know what type of dunks he could put together Kawhi is a is a sneaky athlete Kawhi is somebody who He's methodical with everything he does. He's a mid-range master. His three-point shot has really gotten better. He's physical. He's going to attack you. He can get you out of his way. But then, out of nowhere, he's going to poster somebody. And it's happened now 15 or 16 times in the last two years where he's just sneak postered someone. Last year, I could give you very specific examples. The best one is the Daniel Tice against the Celtics. He goes right down the right side of the lane, and then he just dunks all over him. I mean, he just put his is junk in his face, which is a great term that I wanted to use and get that out for everybody to know. The best part about that dunk, though, this is why I love Kawhi, is that you just know exactly who you're going to get after the game. Someone asked him, well, take us through that whole play. And this is, I swear to God, verbatim how it went. He said, uh, well, Pat passed me the ball, and I took two dribbles. Uh, I got to the basket, and I tried to jump high, and then I dunked. <laughs> And the guy goes, thank you. <laughs> that, was it. that was it. So that's, he's just bring your lunch pail to work type of guy. He's just going to do his work. He's going to quietly go about his business, do his thing. Teammates love him. The players absolutely love him. 
Same in Toronto. Guys loved him in Toronto. And it's because he's got this really good dry sense of humor behind the scenes. He does. He, and the fun guy thing is for real. Every, I swear, every player you ask on the team, who's the funniest guy, who's your funniest teammate? Funniest, I just talked to Reggie Jackson about it two weeks ago. I said, who's the funniest teammate you got? He goes, ah, uh, I'll have to make it a tie. But, I mean, Kawhi probably is, is going to be the answer. But Serge Ibaka is the other one. Both of them are. And they are very close as well. And so to have those guys, they play off of each other super well. He's just, they're great. They really are. But the point is, you don't know what you're going to get any given night. So last year we were in Minnesota. Kawhi scored 42. Paul George scored 46. They scored a combined 88 points in the game. And that can happen at any time. They can just get hot and they can string together a few games where they're hot. And so it's fun to be a part of something like that where you just never know what's going to happen on any given night. Yeah, no, definitely. And as we sail towards the end of this pod, Clipper pun intended, um, my last big question for you before Chris takes us home is how have you adapted to broadcasting during a pandemic? How do you prepare for a game and pregame ritual? Now that could be general broadcast preparing or you can just stick it to this past season or this current (laughs) season. Yeah, I think uh, everything and everybody has adjusted to the pandemic as they've had to. We're all winging it. There's your pun intended. Thank you. We're all winging it as best we can and finding our way through it. There is light at the end of the tunnel, which I'm glad to see. And the vaccines are starting to be administered at a better rate, which is good. The the, the sure, sheer supply of vaccine has improved, which is better. And I think that we are getting closer to, to returning to some sense of normalcy. But most of 2021 is still going to be felt as if we're in it. And as a result, you just have to adjust. You really do. And so it's not the same all of the bubble, I called a, every game from a studio downtown, a, a small little closet-sized studio, and I've got these monitors, computer-sized, and that's it. And I just have to trust that we're going to get the effect sounds from sight. And I have, I don't have an analyst on the radio. I work by myself, so I am the eyes, ears, nose, mouth, whatever. And so I just, I don't even acknowledge during the broadcast that I'm not there. I pretend that I'm there. And my whole goal is if somebody's listening on the radio, I want them to believe that I'm there. I want them to question whether or not I'm there. And I've gotten a lot of texts saying, man, are you in the bubble? That's great. That means I'm doing my job the right way. And so I I take that same mindset, same mentality, same energy into this season. And so this season I get to do the home games from Staples Center and the road games from that same closet sized studio downtown. And so it's a different feel on each one. The home games, while I'm there, it's nowhere close to the same because you can't feed off the crowd. And I think that's probably been the the biggest change for most of the broadcasters around the league, excuse me, has been that there is no crowd to play off of. The energy isn't man-made. You have to concoct it yourself. And so that's been an adjustment. But it's been an adjustment I've been willing to make and I've been happy to make because I've just been excited to be working and doing the games. And the fact that to go to the games that are at Staples this year is a win, in my opinion. So while there might not be any other fans from Steve throwing his legs around, that's fine. I'll feed off of Steve's energy and I'll make my own energy. And so that's the adjustment. When we get back to and I'm so excited. That's Everyone keeps saying, well, what, what's the event you can't wait to do? What are you excited for in your future of broadcasting? I said, any event that's going to have fans, anything that's going to have fans back in the building safely. But I can't wait for the day that we have Lakers, Clippers, and Staples Center full house because those three matchups that we had last year, I have never experienced anything quite like it. The adrenaline, adrenaline rush you get from it the aura in the building, not even it, the closest thing was that, or I guess about the same was that Nets Pacers game that I described. There was also a Nets heat game that was really, really good down to the wire, a couple of overtimes where you just felt the, the, the whole place shaking. It's a different level out here. There's so much of a back and forth between Clippers and Lakers nation. And it comes to a head when they face off in Staples Center. And so to potentially get a playoff series with that, if that could be a seven-game series and we could have full capacity fans, I don't know what that would feel like, but it would be something that nobody has ever experienced before. So I'm hoping that's the case and hoping that we can get some fans this year. Maybe they do meet in the playoffs. If it's half capacity, you'll still feel the juice 
in the Staples Center. And that's really what, what I'm looking forward to. So that would be the adjustment side of things. But for me, I'm just still excited to be working. Yeah, no, de- no definitely. And it's going to be interesting because they're running out of time while they'll both be sharing an arena. So that's another big thing in time that's going to be so fascinating going forward. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, we're all excited for the new arena 2024, 2024 in Inglewood. That is in the works. They are looking to break ground in the next year or two, and it's going to be state of the art. Steve Ballmer doesn't do anything unless it's 150 percent. And this is going to be his whole mindset going in, I should say, has been I want the best basketball viewing experience in the world. And so he's going to make it as such. He's going to involve a variety of very futuristic thinking, futuristic ideals of how to make the fan experience even better. And I'm excited to see how he does it because they've been they've been working with this now for the last couple of years. They've been going around the world, Steve, and my boss, Gillian Zucker, who is the president of business operations and basically Steve's number two. She has been going around the world, different countries, different continents, and trying to see every single sports arena, every single sports stadium to say, okay, what can we take from this to incorporate into ours? And that, to me, is why it's going to be so interesting, because I think they're going to take concepts that don't even fully exist as much here and exist more outside of the U.S., and try to bring them now to California. So I'm excited to see what it looks like and how it feels. And yeah, 2024, we'll have that new stadium right next to the Forum. That'd be crazy. That'd be crazy. I'm excited to see the full thing come to mostly when it just opens up and everything. But final question on both of our Habs is, do you think we'll see a Nets Clippers Noah Ein finals? And if so, will there be another friendly wager on the line as well? I... I don't know. So I don't know if they played this on the on the Nets broadcast last time the Nets and Clippers played. But Michael asked me if there if I had any messages for my dad. And I guess they were going to maybe put it in at some point during during the actual play. And I said, yeah, you know, the, the wager, this and that. But as I said there, I was never a betting man. I lost like a, I lost a Pokemon card when I was eight or nine years old. And I, I was crushed. I thought it was the end. I, I, I swore off betting for the rest of my life and for some reason this matchup has incited this feeling within me you want of, to be the very best like no exactly. one ever was <laughs> thank you I'm, a, I'm glad that you brought in some pokemon by the way that theme song slaps that oh is yeah yeah dude 25 years who would have thought i i completely forgot it was amazing someone someone on social media put that it they think that there was just a bon jovi cover band that did it 100%, but it still was absolutely immaculate. When you really listen back to it, it gets you pumped up. I feel like it would be in Rocky Three. It's like the perfect quintessential 80s montage song, if you really think about it. Well, Steve anyway, Bomber's got to get a Pokemon night going. That's all I'll I have what, learned from this. I'll see what I can do. I'll see if I can get him into it. I, I'm not in, I don't know how much he's into the NBA Top Shot stuff, so I'll have to see <laughs> one thing at a time. When I heard Mark Cuban is really uh, spearheading the Top Shot stuff. But I digress. So after giving up that Pokemon card, I thought for sure that was the end of it. And yet somehow here we are, two two games in, I've lost two bets, and now I'm going to be in debt for the rest of my life. So I don't know if I'm going to wager anything else other than just the idea of getting a, a ring. I think that's that's good enough. And hoping that one of us can, can walk away with it. The Nets have had their opportunities. They've had their chances over the years, and it would be really cool to see it happen. The Clippers have never had that opportunity. The Clippers have never gotten out of the second round in franchise history in 50 years as a franchise. So just that is step one, is getting to the conference finals. I think that they're capable of getting all the way. I think they're capable of winning it all. When you've got Kawhi Leonard on your team, and we saw what he did just two years ago with the Raptors, you're going to have a chance. And if Paul George, I think he's in a much better mental state this year, much better physical state than he was all of last year. And I think that's what people didn't realize is, how banged up he was. He was never healthy for a single game last season. And he came in this year. He was healthy. He had a little issue with the foot, but he's back, and that's fully fixed. And so he's good to go. And if those guys are locked in, if they maybe make one more change to the roster, which I think they're looking into as every team who's contending is, who knows what they look like. But I think they have as good a shot as anybody. And I think Teron Liu is is one of the more underrated coaches in the NBA. The dude really, really knows his stuff. And getting a chance to talk to him and pick his brain, you really see just how well-versed he is at, at leading a team through a season. 
and understanding when to push it, understanding when to pull back a little bit. He keeps saying, look, you're going to lose some games, but it's all part of this process of building up this champion, building these guys in this group with the chemistry, with the on-court experience, the clutch game experience. We're just building these habits so that when it comes down to it, we know exactly what we need to do in the exact situation. And so that's why I'd say they're not a finished product. They're not near a finished product. But I'd say within the next, the, the last 10 to 15 games of the regular season, you're going to start to see more of that finished product going into playoffs. And then the defense is going to look entirely different. And I don't think teams are going to be able to score very easily on their defenses as they get into postseason. So I can't really give you a full answer until I see them at their full strength with their full playbook in hand. But I'm hoping for it. I'll tell you that much. It would be a dream come true for me because that means that an Eagle is going to win no matter what. And that's a good thing in my mind. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's nice for you guys to have an insider like Kenny Atkinson on the squad as well. But thank you again. Amazing, by the way. Yeah. Oh, great guy. Great guy. Yeah. Long Island strong. But anyways, thank you so much, Noah, for joining us, for taking a day, uh, you know, your brunch time, whatever you want to call it, to talk to Chris and I. We just really appreciate you coming on. Hopefully one day we'll see your pops. But for now, we got the eagle flying in. <laughs> I appreciate it, guys. Yeah, it's brunch time. I got to go get some la gluten-free banana bread so i'll uh, i'll get out of here that sounds pretty good though it's very good but anyways uh like i said thank you just plug in your social media where you want to be followed and uh chris will take it from there yeah you can find me everywhere at no eagle 15 twitter instagram etc if you want to follow me you can find a lot of clipper stuff i do a bunch of stuff with tennis channels so if you're a tennis fan you can find some tennis stuff as well uh find me on sirius xm from time to time the nba channel I'm around. I, I just kind of hang around, so you'll find me there. Well, that's perfect. Well, guys, remember to send over any suggestions, questions, comments, or thoughts on any of our content by sending an email to wingspanpodcast at gmail.com. And do not forget to follow us on our social media accounts. But most importantly, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on your preferred listening service. And as for next time, stay classy, take care, and wear a mask. <laughs>